super, super happy that we are able to get these gentlemen, uh, other than Shane, I'm excuse me, <laughs> gentleman category. Uh, Professor Stansberry is my colleague here, and, and we, he's been a tremendous uh, teammate uh, working uh, with Lens, but also bringing a whole other level of national security law teaching here, the courses he teaches, uh, investigating and prosecuting national security cases, uh, evidence. He co-teaches national security law with me and probably, oh, he does the cyber law course, at cyber law and policy. But in any event, he's going to, uh, we're really privileged to have these gentlemen, you know, break loose from their busy schedules to join us. <coughs> Shane, without further ado. Great. Thank you, Charlie. Um, so we are very lucky here, um, and welcome everybody uh, to talk about domestic terrorism with um, these two gentlemen. And uh, their bios are um, in your materials, so I'm not going to go into those. But I think their uh, titles are actually relevant uh, to our discussion because they both come from the Department of Justice, but from two very different perspectives. Uh, so uh, Tom Brzezowski, to my immediate right, is the Council for Domestic Terrorism. And I think if I'm right, you're the only person who has ever held that job. It was created, um, uh, I like to probably think with you in mind, but uh, you um, have been serving that role for several years um, after a distinguished uh, career at, uh, both in the Army and at the FBI. Uh, and so you uh, come at this from a bird's eye view in Washington. Uh, and to Tom's uh, right, we have Michael Easley, Jr., who is the U.S. Attorney um, here in Raleigh, uh, who's the top-ranking law enforcement uh, official in the Eastern District of North Carolina um, and uh, covers 44 counties. A substantial uh, part of uh, federal crime is prosecuted in that district and uh, probably the most significant national security cases uh, in this area are prosecuted out of that district. So two very different but important perspectives. And I want to start with that because uh, before we get into the nuts and bolts of domestic terrorism, I think um, it's helpful for those who are not um, as familiar with how DOJ operates and might think of it as a monolith. Um, Tom, can you start by just describing what your role is and how you approach uh, this topic from where you sit? Sure. And again, thank you very much for the opportunity to participate. Um, I really enjoy these, these these types of engagements. So to, to, to your point earlier, I am the Domestic Terrorism Council for the National Security Division of the Department of Justice. As you noted earlier, that position was created um, many years ago, back in 2015, um, by the leadership of the National Security Division of the DOJ. Um, and, it, it, and the reason being was because at that time, we'll all recall, of course, that the primary uh, focus of the government, really the, the United States government, was ISIS, Al-Qaeda, threats that are stemming therefrom. Um, and uh, the, the Assistant Attorney General for National Security at the time uh, recognized that, that there was a bit of a, a disconnect in terms of um, what he was charged with doing, which was essentially uh, protecting the country against threats emanating from both domestic and international terrorism. And he's doing a great job on the international terrorism piece, and, uh, you know, taking off guys that were getting on planes heading to Syria to fight for ISIS, I mean, uh, charging those guys left and right. However, at the same time, um, there was a plot that was disrupted out in Spokane, Washington, that concerned a white supremacist who planted a uh, IED, a very powerful IED, um, along the parade route of a Martin Luther King parade that was due to, to occur that later that day. And but for some uh, a brave custodian finding that device, um, it would have been catastrophic. And he realized that that, that generated very to little, no, little press at the time, whereas the 19-year-old kid who was getting on the plane to fly to Syria was, was generating all the press. And he, he realized there might have been a disconnect. And as a consequence, he brought me online um, to, 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 to help provide the Justice Department with a bit more fulsome picture of, of what domestic terrorism is um, and, and the nature of the threat and how we might better um, structure ourselves to combat it. Michael? Thank you, Shane. Uh, I'm the United States Attorney for Eastern North Carolina, and that role really is the representative of the United States Department of Justice uh, in, in the U.S. Attorney's given district. And your responsibility, uh, whereas Tom's responsibility and, and experience is deep in a very specific subject matter area, uh, my responsibility and experience uh, is broad and covers uh, the gamut between all manner of violent crime, narcotics trafficking, 
civil rights violations, and, and always uh, uh, national security elements. Uh, that national security focus for us ranges from an immigration unit that handles uh, uh, fraud and on, on our immigration system uh, all the way across to domestic and international terrorism. We work closely with our Joint Terrorism Task Force, which uh, is a body that brings all law enforcement partners to the table to assess the threat landscape in our district in eastern North Carolina, uh, and then devises strategies for how we build partnerships and organize ourselves uh, to abate that threat. And um, that uh, effort that Tom is sort of spearheaded at the Department of Justice around building our capacity to address domestic violent extremism and domestic terrorism trickles down into what we do as, as we similarly build capacity that is tooled to our specific uh, environment with the goal of uh, deploying the Department of Justice broader strategy to address the threat. So we're, we're taking uh, guidance, we're deploying the four pillars of the national domestic terrorism strategy, but trying to tool it uh, for, for custom made for Eastern North Carolina based on our local knowledge and our local partnerships. So that's helpful. And uh, you may notice uh, from Michael's bio that he is a proud and distinguished uh, graduate of the University of North Carolina, so we appreciate him coming behind enemy lines today. Uh, tough, tough, tough semester. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so uh, Michael, you mentioned uh, the term domestic violent extremism, and um, I want to uh, turn back to Tom, actually, because uh, the word domestic terrorism can be kind of loaded, uh, and it's a little bit vague for some folks um, when they're thinking about these kinds of threats. Some people might think about some of the most um, you know, serious and violent actors uh, in January 6th. We saw these recent trials of uh, you know, the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys. Um, but uh, as we know, the threat is sort of much broader than what we see on TV. So can you break down uh, just sort of how uh, DOJ looks um, at these different categories that we and the public might place under the big umbrella of domestic terrorism? Sure. And, and, I, and I should hasten to add here that the lion's share of the work that occurs in, with regard to domestic terrorism is, is conducted by, by the FBI. Um, they're the, the, they are vested with primary jurisdiction to investigate all um, in, incidences of domestic terrorism around the country. And then, of course, our U.S. attorneys community, they're the folks that are actually bringing these cases and charging them in court. We at headquarters, we just kind of manage the show a little bit. Um, but the real work is on the ground um, in these jurisdictions. So I wanted to make that point uh, very clear before I started. Um, so w with regard to domestic violent extremism, domestic terrorism, you should know that these are essentially synonymous terms. You'll see them used interta interchangeably for the most part. But at the end of the day, um, from a government standpoint, they're largely synonymous. And within within domestic violent extremism, there are separate separate categories that the FBI has 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 instituted. You'll hear you'll, you'll hear them described as racially and ethnically motivated violent extremists or REMV. Um, you'll hear uh, discussions about um, anti-government and anti-authority violent extremists or agave. There's always a you know an acronym, of course. And we're not far behind the military in that sense, but. Uh, um, and then they'll, there will be very specific uh, uh, categories associated with anti-abortion extremists, for example, or anti-animal um, right or animal rights or environmental extremists. Um, so these are all subcategories that the, uh, the FBI has constructed. And, you, and the, the key point I want to want to hammer home here is that these are largely art, artificial categories that are simply constructed by the FBI with a view towards cabining or developing their intelligence picture. They have no independent legal um, authority or significance. And that's a key point to make sure that you understand, because a lot of times folks in the broader public will think, oh, well, the FBI instituted this new intelligence category. That means that they're using that as some, somehow, some, some kind of authority to go after this particular group of people. Not the case. It's merely an artificial construct developed to better enable them to develop a more fulsome intelligence picture. And so um, I'm going to stay with you, uh, Tom, for a minute. So um, getting to the second part of uh, my question, uh, you know, how do we sort of place, um, you know, people like the most extreme uh, members of the Oath Keepers and Proud Boys, you know, the people that we see in the popular press, 
Um, are those representative of um, the types of threats that uh, FBI and DOJ are prioritizing? Or you know, what, what is it that we need to know about the threat that we don't already know? Well, I think you'll, you'll, you'll note that, of course, you, you did mention the Proud Boys and Oath Keepers for sure. And, that, and those cases are, are obviously of immense importance, especially given the, the, uh, the, the novel charges that have been brought in, in connection with those, including seditious conspiracy. That said, um, probably the most potent threat is and remains, and this is this is this is borne out by by, by remarks by the by the director and other senior officials of the DOJ, the lone offender threat, and that is an individual who develops an idiosyncratic, oftentimes blended ideology, pulling things from the internet, the you know, far reaches of the internet, and then gives effect to that ideology through violence. And a prime example of this, of course, is the recent attack in uh, the supermarket in uh, Buffalo, New York which is exhibit A of the, the nature of the threat that we're, we're contending with right now. And we can talk a little bit later about the, uh, the unique characteristics of that threat, which regrettably are not becoming, or are becoming increasingly not unique anymore. But that, that remains um, the, this most significant and potent threat. That being said, I will also note that you know, the FBI is presently conducting over 2,500 active domestic terrorism investigations around the country as we speak. Um, and many of these concern threats which have been directed towards public officials and, and, and other individuals. Um, and I'm not talking about like, you know, free speech type of threats. I'm talking about true threats. And that's a, that's a species of speech that is outside the scope of First Amendment protected activity and is in and of itself a federal violation under certain circumstances. Um, those, those are, are becoming um, the, the, one, of the, one, of the, one of the most significant things that the FBI has been working on lately. And Michael, I know uh, domestic terrorism is, is one of your priorities. Can you tell us a little bit about how you see the threat in North Carolina? What kind of actors and threats that you're focused on? Yeah, absolutely. I, well, Tom raised a, a great point, which is that the big network, big organizations are not what we're seeing as the most live and potentially vital threat that we face. It is the small cell, it is the person who's self-radicalizing, and broadly speaking, there is this uh, term of salad bar uh, radicalization or salad bar extremism where folks will pick up different slices of ideology, whether that is incel related or anti-government or anarchist. Uh, so there are a lot of different elements that folks will draw from. Uh, but the most uh, fatal threat that I think we've seen that the data would bear out is that threat of racially motivated violent extremists. Uh, the militia threat surely is there, uh, and within racially motivated violent extremists, this subset of white supremacists uh, uh, are significant drivers of real-life violence. And that is borne out in the types of cases that we uh, have indicted in the Eastern District of North Carolina. Um, our cases are ongoing, so uh, I, I sort of have my mental list of, of all those cases, and they're cases that I'm personally keeping up on. Um, and those tend to have a white nationalist, neo-Nazi flair, they tend to have an anti-government extremist flair. Whether they qualify as domestic terrorism or not, uh, or if they are simply uh, folks that are engaged in violations of Title 18 uh, and, and criminals who also harbor those ideologies, that, that's an issue too. Outlaw motorcycle gangs is one. So we had a huge... Uh, case recently against the Pagans Outlaw Motorcycle Gang, which uh, are covered in Nazi paraphernalia and engaged in violence and have a, a white nationalist flavor to them. So those are, the, I think, the, the, the ideological elements that we see the most of. But I think Tom would agree and would say that we don't pick our cases based on ideology. We focus on the cases that are indicative of violence. When people want to give life to their ideology through violence, irrespective of what that ideology is, that is where we focus our effort and that's where we spring into action and that's what we're concerned about. Now it so happens that the cases we've seen and that we've indicted recently are of that flavor, but there is, as has been described, 
a witch's brew of bad ideas on the internet. And disaffected people will glom onto them, embrace those ideologies, they get filtered into encrypted chats with people who enable and encourage them, and they go down that rabbit hole of violence. And so that, I think, is the bigger issue. It's less about the idea and more about this, uh, this uh, it's as if we have this kindling laying around of folks that are so willing to be inspired to violence. So, Tom, uh, back to you. So I, I want to get your thoughts on, on what Michael said. Um, just looking at the landscape nationwide, um, is this uh, picture that, that Michael just described indicative of, you mentioned uh, over 2,500 active investigations, right? Uh, I imagine some of those are probably related to Jan 6, but uh, certainly a lot of them are not. Um, I think the number, uh, the last official number that I saw that the FBI and DHS released to Congress um, was definitely north of that, and I think it was double uh, the number of investigations the year before. So if you take those investigations, um, how much of the, uh, those investigations are looking like the picture that Michael was just describing? Racially motivated, uh, sort of the salad bar type mentality, and most importantly, indicative of violence. Yeah, well, all of them are going to be indicative of violence, and and as and then that's that's a point that that that, that, that we can't underscore enough. Um, and uh, thank you for, for for raising that because at the, at the end of the day, as was noted, the animating ideology uh, underscoring a lot of this activity is largely, from a legal perspective, immaterial. Um, that, that of course changes a little bit depending on the statute you might be charging, but for the most part. The animating ideology is not something of consequence from a legal perspective. What is, is if somebody is looking to give effect to that ideology through violence. That is the trigger which would initiate an FBI investigation in the first instance. And so we, we spend quite a bit of time talking about the fact that, you know, it, it, here, here in the United States, you're, you're, you're allowed to, to think whatever you, you want. And a lot of people have some, some thoughts that are, that are that maybe not the mainstream, let's to put it kindly. Um, that, that, but it's the folks that are looking to give effect to that through violence and that are going to be of particular interest to the FBI and, and the DOJ. And, 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 and you're right. I think uh, the, F, the, the FBI director has, has, has noted on more than one occasion that the, uh, the, the primary threat does appear at this juncture to stem from the REM v, um, mo, uh, the REM v uh, specific threat. That's the racially and ethnically motivated violent extremists with uh, the white supremacist uh, subset of that being in the forefront. Um, and again, regrettably, um, the recent major domestic terrorism attacks that have occurred in this country in the past several years have, have given, um, I, I bear that, that bear that fat, fact out. If you think about the, the supermarket attack in Buffalo, if you think about the Tree of Life synagogue attack in, in, in Pittsburgh, if you think about the Charlottesville attack with the, with the car, if you think about a Dylan Roof in South Carolina, if you think about the El Paso shooter in, in, down in Texas, all fit into the category that it was just described, namely Remvi motivated. Um, but each also has an interesting element in that it, it does suggest that there is, we say, and this is an important point to make, um, that these individuals are, are broadly lone offenders. That's not entirely true um, in the sense that they are part of a very loose network of, or, of individuals that engage in this pernicious call and return cycle on the Internet and the darker corners of the web in encrypted chat platforms globally, I should add, and that's the new frontier, and we'll probably talk about this later on, of domestic terrorism. It's this phenomenon called transnational domestic terrorism. Get your head around that for a little bit. Um, so that's kind of where we sit right now, and that's the nature of the threat. I do want to come back to that. Um, but first, I want to um, hit on something, a specific type of threat that uh, we've talked about before um, that I think is hits close to home uh, for you, Michael, because you had to deal with it. Uh, so late last year, we had uh, an attack on critical infrastructure. Uh, there was a, um, in Moore County, uh, there were, I think, 40,000 plus people without power uh, because mm -hmm. there was an attack on, uh, on the grid there. Uh, other attacks like that have occurred in uh, California. And uh, I think this is not the first incident you've told me in, in North Carolina. Um, so uh, we see a lot more written uh, now about this threat against critical infrastructure. Um, many of us think a, a lot about cr critical infrastructure in the cyber context, but not as many people are thinking about it in the domestic terrorism context. Um, can you talk a little bit about 
um, how you're viewing that threat. And I know you probably can't talk about the active investigation uh, or case, but um, how that fits into the broader landscape that you're seeing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and Tom, with his depth of subject matter expertise on some of this, may be able to provide some color. Uh, but in DT, domestic terrorist ideology, uh, particularly in the anti-government extremist realm, the notion of attacking the power grid and triggering a hard reset of society writ large and rebuilding it with this uh, anti-government, uh, white nationalist uh, foundation is a key theme in domestic terrorist ideology, and it goes back a very long way. And it is something that, and, and again, I sort of will defer to our friends in the FBI, right? We're not analysts, uh, but, but it is in the public uh, dialogue, so I can raise it here. But that, that is a common theme in some of these encrypted uh, channels. And the types of communications that are happening in these encrypted channels is far more frightening than many of average people could ever imagine. And much of those communications are First Amendment protected speech, which unlike in the international terrorism space where providing material support to a terrorist group is a crime in and of itself, the communications that occur around this ideology and the trading of information around uh, details of our uh, uh, power grid and methods of attacking it, that chatter is out there. And uh, there are many who will talk about giving effect to that. And while I cannot speak about the investigation in Moore County in particular, we have another case uh, that we've indicted, it, which is among, I think, a trio of cases involving small cells with plans to attack uh, the power grid and critical infrastructure. In our case, uh, four men conspired. Two were former Marines out of Camp Lejeune. They were in the business of manufacturing firearms. They all met through an online forum, which has now been shut down, called Iron March. So they meet through this neo-Nazi Iron March forum, and as is the playbook, they transition to encrypted channels and start to recruit others and, and have this encrypted app. They've not met each other in person, but they begin to develop these relationships, and they start to conspire as to how to damage U.S. energy facilities. And they do a fairly in-depth analysis as alleged. I want to be clear, these are allegations. This is... This is I'm not sharing anything that is not in the public record through an indictment uh, or otherwise. So noted, and, counsel. That's right. <laughs> All are innocent until proven guilty. Um, and, and talk about how do we acquire explosives, what would the means be to do this, and um, then they meet to train. And uh, they have live fire training where they, they also film a video, that kind of has a flavor of some of what we see in, uh, you know, Al Qaeda type um, uh, trends, and they're shooting short barrel rifles or, or possessing short barrel rifles rather, uh, wearing Adam Waffen masks, which is the neo-Nazi group, and displaying Nazi symbols, and um, those types of cases where you see disaffected young men some coming out of military where they actually have trainings, have training and experience in explosives and, uh, and small arms, um, those are very concerning cases. And it's not, we in Eastern North Carolina are, are only one of a trio of recent cases. I know you've had experience in similar ones. Right. Well, there, there was another one in Ohio, which a uh, similar situation. Uh, a small group of uh, three individuals were conspiring to attack a, a electrical substation. With the, and, and, and the reason they're doing this, which is, is not terribly different from the reason that, that, that the folks in your jurisdiction did it, was pursuant to what, what's styled as a, 
I don't think we talked about it. You wanted me to touch on accelerationist ideology, broadly speaking, um, as was a recent individual who was indicted up in the District of Maryland a couple weeks ago, maybe last week, was it? I can't remember. I get my date straight. Early uh, yep. Uh, Brandon Russell um, was uh, recently indicted in connection, again, with another uh, conspiracy to attack uh, a series of electrical substations up in uh, the Baltimore area. The interesting thing about Mr. Russell is that he is the former um, co-leader or founder, really, of a group called the Atomwaffen, which is German for nuclear war, if you, if you loosely translate it. Um, this organization had as one of its, um, one of its uh, objectives uh, the targeting of nuclear facilities in and around, uh, all around the country. Um, and it has been implicated in a series of deaths um, attributed to, to its group, as well as a series of threats that have been um, disseminated um, around the country in connection with Adam Waffen. Adam Waffen itself now has several subchapters in South America, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, and elsewhere. Um, and another, um, to, to, to your point, you, you mentioned the, the hard reset, and, and, and that's, that's actually not by accident. There there's actually a publication that exists, and again, some of the darker corners of the web, um, the, 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 the terrogram it's called, um, that's called the hard reset. And it's really a how-to guide for fellow travelers associated with this accelerationist ideology who are bent on targeting the critical infrastructure. It shows where to shoot at the critical, you know, where to shoot at the electrical substation to, to knock it out, how to do it, what kind of rifles you should use, how to creep up on it, that sort of thing. Um, and again, why are they doing this? Well, the idea here is to accelerate the downfall of modern society so that a new white nationalist order can be, you know, erected in its ashes, if you will. Um, this goes all the way back, by the way, to... McVeigh, Timothy McVeigh, you'll, you'll note, was the, the individual that, that, that conducted the Oklahoma City bombing. Um, he is widely considered to be kind of one of the preeminent founders of this, this ideology, although he himself likely would not recognize it. The name, that's precisely what he was trying to do um, with regard to um, his activity in Oklahoma City. I mean, these are deep-seated grievances that have marinated and cascaded over time, um, starting with Ruby Ridge on to Waco. Onto, onto the Oklahoma City. And now McVeigh is held up as, as a saint, a martyr figure, if you will, amongst this community of individuals that are looking to accelerate the, the downfall of contemporary society. Um, so, and then, and that's, that's just one little sliver of the, the broader domestic terrorism picture. Um, so lest we, we, we are, you know, put, have blinders on and, and are looking solely at the white nationalist, white supremacist angle to this, please be advised that, that Domestic violent extremist concerns, again, anybody that is animated by any ideology that looks to give effect to that ideology through force or violence. So it's not just about white nationalism, but that is a very potent manifestation of what we're seeing out there. So one thing that I heard uh, both of you mention was that at least uh, some of these uh, people who are making the press, uh, a number of them are ex-military. We have a number of uh, folks in the military here uh, and ex-military um, Tom, uh, how do you view that? Uh, is, is that something that DOJ and FBI are thinking about? How do you, um, when you hear this, um, how do you make sense of it? Uh, it's, it's a complicated issue. You, you, the, 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 my, my colleagues here in, in the military will know, of course, that the DOD has made significant strides in connection with uh, targeting domestic violent extremism. They have, they have uh, instituted a brand new policy that touches on extremist activity in the military, which is no small thing for the DOD to do, by the way, is creating a new policy and actually implementing it. <laughs> um, so that's, that's, but, hey, this is political. Um, and, you know, you're getting blowback from some uh, subcommittees on the Hill, um, stripping the DOD of, of dollars associated with giving effect to extremist activity. Um, you know, so it has become a political cudgel that has been wielded by both the left and right in connection with politics. Because we have to be mindful of, at, the, at, at its essence, terrorism of, of, of both the international and domestic flavors is inherently political. What we're talking about it's political violence. And we conceptually ha don't have too much of a problem when, when that violence is directed from the outside in. We, 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 we understand when somebody from some faraway country is, is looking to, to, to target us um, pursuant to their, their political beliefs. Well, we get that conceptually. That's foreign terror. That's international terrorism. But when the gaze is directed inward, and we're talking about ourselves, our own collective political situation, then it becomes much more fraught. And that's why we try, uh, we strive and we do 
um, to make the cleanest distinction between what we mean when we say domestic terrorism so as to avoid uh, being uh, characterized as being political in any way, shape, or form. But to your point on it, and that was a very circuitous way of getting to the military piece, um, we do think about this quite, quite often. Um, and we, we make every effort we can to partner with our, our military uh, our counterparts. Um, I myself um, do a, a component of the uh, DOMOPS course in the Charlottesville, the, the JAG school. And for those of you who are here, I was, a lot, I was told I could make a pitch. And for, especially from the academies, I do occasionally I'll do a course uh, with some of the academies. But this is an opportunity for, for you to consider taking this back and incorporating it as part of your curricula. I think it's important. The reason being is because, in my view, from a, from a national security practitioner perspective, setting aside the threat posture, but from a national security practitioner perspective, it's incumbent upon you JAGs out there or burgeoning JAGs um, to be mindful of what this is so that you can recognize it when you contend with it. Because we collectively, both the DOJ and the military, have an effect concurrent jurisdiction in this connection, in this, in this situation. If you've got a service member in the ranks that is conducting this activity, you can hit them with a UCMJ charge, administrative action, whatever the case might be. But you also have an affirmative obligation to connect with the FBI and the National Security Division and your local U.S. Attorney's Office to get in front of this issue. And if you don't know what you're looking at, you're not going to be postured to do that. And so that's why it's important, in my view, um, to, to at least um, orient everybody to what, what this issue is. Thank you. I, that, that, that's my yeah. pitch. Oh, yeah. Tom, that is so well said. <laughs> and I think it hits on another key theme here, key takeaway. With respect to international terrorism, we have this huge intelligence apparatus with statutory authority, with the ability to, to use the FISA court to get visibility into communications on foreign nationals. That doesn't exist in the domestic terrorism space. And it never will because we have civil liberties and constitutional rights and freedom of speech and freedom of association in this country and we cannot jeopardize that. There's a tension there. Yeah. We want to be proactive but we can't jeopardize our civil liberties in the process. And as a result, intelligence in the international terrorism space quite often flows from the top down. In the domestic terrorism, in the domestic extremism place, intelligence flows from the bottom up. And that means my job, Tom's job, is to build those relationships and build that connective tissue with local law enforcement in the ruralist corner of eastern North Carolina so that their antenna is up to these issues, as well as with our many military bases in eastern North Carolina so that the lowest level patrol officer on that base knows how to recognize and think when they see that there are explosive making materials in the back of this guy's car. And I, and I recognize uh, that black sun as a Nazi symbol. That, if there is a, a gap that we are all rushing to fill, it is in building, capacity building, in our local lowest level partner's ability to recognize and escalate and know who to contact um, when they see these kinds of threats. And I credit our partners in the Department of Defense for leaning into this. Um, and we've got more to do, not just on the investigative piece with DOD, but also in the educational piece to ensure that our enlisted men and women who have answered the call to serve this nation are also being equipped with the tools to recognize when they're being bumped and recruited into something that is contrary to the oath that they have sworn to protect and uphold the Constitution of the United States that they take pride in their ability to recognize disinformation, that we're promoting media literacy uh, in, in our troops, so that either while they serve or that when they return from combat, they aren't susceptible uh, to these kinds of approaches. And I think our friends at DOD are really working hard to do that and to do it in a sensitive way uh, that doesn't feel paternalistic uh, and that really uh, enlists our men and women in, in, um, in the military to protect our, our American values and our Constitution, um, uh, both during and after their service. But I think I hear you saying that there are still some gaps in that local capacity building. Absolutely. It's, it's something that we're, we're, we're working to build because there are corners of, of our country 
uh, you know, deep southwest Virginia and Appalachia and, and out west where local law enforcement and local uh, folks may not always have the greatest trust of the federal government. And so trying to build that trust and make this threat real to them um, and, um, and to have those lines of communication open so that when they see something that doesn't seem right, um, they, they may ask a question or they may put it on our radar. So that's an area we've got to build out. And we in Eastern North Carolina are actively trying to do. And I think that that type of engagement is helpful. I'll give another just sort of example of capacity building that's non-traditional is there's been some outreach to militia groups to say, look, we respect your right to, to bear arms. We respect your right to peaceably assemble and to in the freedom to associate. But we want to be sure that there are not bad actors that want to overthrow government, that want to uh, accelerate the demise of society and undermine our Constitution, that take advantage of your groups uh, to do harm to what we all love, which is our Constitution and, and our freedom in America. And so I think this threat requires non-traditional outreach as well, not just to law enforcement, but to corners of our community uh, that are in a position to see it. Similarly to our um, uh, international uh, terrorism cases, it required a lot of outreach to uh, community groups to help us identify and uh, uh, those who would take advantage of what is a, a very uh, peaceful religion and use it uh, improperly to, to motivate folks to violence for political means. So, so Tom, I want to get your perspective on this. There's uh, a lot to that, and I think it's really interesting, um, this sort of bottom-up uh, capacity building and the need for that. But um, there is a need for top-down um, information sharing as well, right? And uh, to uh, this administration and DOJ's credit, we've seen some movement in the last few years, uh, probably more mo movement than, than you've probably seen in your career as, uh, as counsel. Um, we have the first, um, I think the first of its kind, national strategy on domestic terrorism uh, that was implemented a couple of uh, years ago. And then um, we have uh, an attorney general who was actually involved in the Timothy McVeigh um, investigation and has made it a priority. Um, more uh, tangibly, we have you know NSD, National Security Division of DOJ, who has devoted more resources to this problem. Um, and I know you personally have been involved in efforts to better track uh, uh, DT cases. So um, it, it, I just want to um, think about is is those efforts. Um, what are they? Are we seeing any fruits of those efforts? And what role do they play in, in sort of trying to meet the challenge? In addition to this sort of bottom up capacity building. Yeah, they play a, a tremendous role um, in the sense that um, you know. A couple years back, the the the, uh, the landscape was very very different, um, and the legal landscape, I should say, um, and the policy landscape uh, within the DOJ in particular. Uh, actually, the legal landscape hasn't hasn't really changed all that much, I should say. But the, the policy landscape has certainly shifted significantly in the sense that um, there there has been, as you rightly note, uh, the first ever U.S. Uh, strategy, national strategy for countering domestic terrorism, which is a significant um, a significant event in the sense that it's a first national level strategy that's centered entirely on domestic terrorism, no, the first one of its kind. Um, secondly, uh, the, the, uh, within the National Security Division, we have uh, created what, what's called the Domestic Terrorism Unit, which is exclusively dedicated towards uh, coordinating uh, domestic terrorism prosecutions all around the country. So we've got dedicated folks that are doing that work. Um, you know, I, I have a role in that as well. Um, and then, the, on the data piece, it's kind of boring and met, metric focused, I know, but, but data is where the dollars are, as we all kind of know. Um, and as a consequence, we, you know, previously, prior to the initiation of this new policy within the DOJ that mandates U.S. Attorney's, Office from, U.S. Attorney's offices from all around the country to affirmatively report any domestic terrorism case that they are handling to the National Security Division, prior to that, um, that sort of reporting did not occur. And as a consequence, we at the National Security Division had no particular 
um, feel for how many prosecutions were happening around the country that were connected to domestic terrorism. Now, the FBI has always had a data set, and they've always had DT numbers, of course. Um, but the prosecutions associated with that, we never really had an answer to that question when we were posed it by various oversight committees on the Hill and whatnot. But now, as a result of this new policy, we will have an answer to that. And this is important because it will inform congressional oversight committees and, by extension, the broader public about the work that we're doing in connection with domestic violent extremism. Um, and then, of course, there's, 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 a, uh, there's a funding piece associated with that. There's an allocation of resources funding piece that, that certainly goes along with that. There's an academic piece that goes along with that. It's, it's allowing the, the bird cottage industry out there of, of uh, practitioners, both in institutions like this one um, and, and around the country, who do solid research on this issue to have something to work with. Um, so in that respect, it's a, it's a pretty significant shift on the policy landscape. Can, can I stay with you and uh, ask you about another element of that, which is um, you and I have talked about kind of the signaling effect. So um, if we look back at the last, you know, 10, 15 years when um, you had incidents like, you know, the Dylan Roof uh, shooting in, in Charleston, you had, um, uh, you mentioned a couple of these examples, the Charlottesville rally uh, when Alex Field uh, drove into the counter protesters, uh, all the way up to Buffalo, right? Um, those of us who pay attention to this stuff have, have noted um, a change in rhetoric um, at, at DOJ. Uh, we've noticed it in the press releases, we've noticed it in the speeches, um, and we've noticed more of a willingness to use that phrase, domestic terrorism, to describe these kinds of events, even though, uh, as we know, because there's no federal domestic terrorism criminal statute, um, the charges that are often brought uh, are not labeled domestic terrorism. They may be uh, hate crimes. They may be other, uh, you know, sort of um, firearms-related offenses. But uh, DOG has been um, ready, willing, and able to use that term uh, in recent years. Can you talk a little bit about that and that shift? Yeah, so just to set that up, for those who may not be you know, immediately familiar with the, the, the legal architecture that governs how we do our business, you rightly note that uh, and it comes as a surprise to a lot of folks that uh, at the federal level, there is no criminal violation that outlaws domestic terrorism per se. It doesn't exist. Um, and as a consequence, many say, well, if that's the case, and you've got all these domestic terrorism investigations you've been talking about, what do you, what do you charge these guys with? And the answer is precisely what you noted. Pretty much anything in Title 18 or really anything in the, in the criminal code, the federal criminal code that we want. Um, and so it's, think about it like, it's kind of like the Al Capone approach. We all know that Al Capone, of course, hit with a tax charge, right? But he was a criminal underlord. Um, it's the same thing with domestic terrorism in many respects, in the sense that if, if the guy happens to be a felon in possession of a weapon, guess what? That's what he's going to get hit with. Um, now, that being said, this is a two-step dance that, that's required, because if, if we charge this individual with being felon in possession of a weapon, nothing on that public-facing charge sheet is going to say the word terrorism. And so as a consequence, when the public sees, what the public sees is some random guy that just happened to get hit with a gun charge. They don't know that he was actually trying to secure a weapon to go shoot up a, a synagogue, and that he was actually, in our view, a, a domestic terrorist. So how do we signal that to the broader public? What we do is we use press releases. Uh, we use public-facing process in connection with the lit in, during the litigation life cycle of that particular case. So, and again, I, I don't want to go too deep on, on folks, but I mean, if, if there's a detention hearing, for example, in, in connection with a person that's just being hit with a gun charge, a federal prosecutor can walk into that detention hearing and say, your Honor, this person is a domestic terrorist. He should be detained. Um, or, and then finally, alternatively, on the back end, we have a, a, what's called a terrorism enhancement that's available to us during the sentencing phase of, 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 of litigation. We can also leverage that to signal to the broader public, this guy is a domestic terrorist, regardless of what the language you're seeing on the charge sheet. And so these are the tools that we're trying to more aggressively leverage um, so to communicate to the broader public what is it? What it is that we're about in connection with our fight against violent domestic violent extremism? Michael, you have anything on that? And doing that yeah. helps us build that capacity because then when I go meet with a local sheriff and I say, "Hey, you may have seen this case we indicted last week, where this young man uh, tried to sell explosives to kill federal law enforcement, allegedly, um, and this happened right up the road from you." So I'm not showing him, "Hey." This is a felon in possession of a firearm case. I got a thousand of those, right? Uh, we're able to use it as an example that yes, 
this is real. This isn't, this isn't just, uh, you know, a media talking point. This is here. And the more we can show that and talk about that, the more it begins to reach a higher level of consciousness among local law enforcement and they get more alert to the threat. So what, what, what we're talking about is not just putting out a press release to pat ourselves on the back, right? It is building knowledge and capacity and raising this uh, in the public consciousness and the attention of those in the best position to flag it, which is everybody in this room, uh, which is all people in all corners of every county uh, in the state of North Carolina and beyond. Can I, I want to leave some time for questions, um, and we've got about eight minutes left to do that. Um, but before we do that, I just have one more question for you, Michael, which uh, touches on a, a theme that you mentioned early on. Um, and there's a tension, right, between both of you have said that, you know, these investigations are focused on people with uh, some indication of violence, right? We think they're actually a violent threat. Um, same time, there's some tension there, right? Uh, between the fact that to investigate these people, um, a lot of what you're doing is tracking sort of information sharing that is protected by the First Amendment, right? Uh, you mentioned this, Michael, that the fact that a lot of this chatter is, is you know, um, is protected First Amendment activity. Um, so can you talk a little bit about how you uh, navigate that and how that uh, plays into charging decisions? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, first I'll say it is very hard it requires a lot of rigor, and it requires a lot of discipline on the part of those who are entrusted to be the prosecutors and the agents investigating those cases. And so much of the cues that uh, Maine Justice can put out to locals as to how to handle these cases uh, can be incredibly helpful. And, and I, I want everyone to know that we have a, a body of very good stewards at the Department of Justice who are nonpartisan, who are not ideological, who only care about public safety, protecting the American people, and doing it in a way that is consistent with our values. And when we look at a, uh, a, a potential threat, and we think about how to investigate it. If we begin to jeopardize our values uh, to, in order to build a case, we have this desire. None of us as a U.S. attorney wants the Buffalo shooting to happen in our district. We don't want to let that happen. So we have a desire to get left of boom. We want to avoid and disrupt before things happen. Um, but we also cannot jeopardize the civil liberties of our people. And so you, you sort of have to get good at using traditional tools. Could be a Title III wiretap. Could be the use of informants to gather more information. Uh, could be uh, surveillance. But you have to have some indication of criminality or violence in order to activate those tools, right? And that goes back to this idea of capacity building and local intelligence being able to, to bubble up. Because without somebody raising their hand and bringing this uh, potential threat to our attention, we can't then activate uh, our, our ability. We're not going to surveil people because they have bad ideas. Um, that, that's not our role. And so that's very hard work. And so I'll close with a pitch. We see these threats. We see these, these, these killings, and we see them continue to happen, and we say, why don't they do something? Well, they are doing a whole lot, but they are all of you, too. And this very difficult work that is done, this delicate balancing of being proactive versus ensuring we protect our civil liberties, it's hard work, and we need bright minds to do it. And so those of you who are sitting in this room that have an interest in this, or you wouldn't be here, know that every single person who is an official or who sits on one of these panels wants to hear from you. We want to create a pipeline of bright young talent that cares about our Constitution and cares about protecting people and keeping people safe. 
So those who are sitting here today, approach the folks that sit on these panels and let us introduce you to what we do. Let us introduce you to the Department of Justice and let us create an on-ramp uh, for the brightest minds in this country to help solve these problems. I will definitely second that. Uh, General, do, you wanna, uh, do we have time for a couple questions? Yeah, I, yeah. I think we do. Do we have some questions out there? Let's, uh, let's go with the scholar. Uh, That neither one wants to answer. <laughs> I, 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 uh, I, I've been well, I'm well schooled in how to answer this. You know, you know, and I'm not going to give you the soundbite answer, but uh, because there's obviously two sides to, 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 to the argument. To be sure, there are those that say, um, and, and of course, it, it's not going to surprise you that I, I'm not going to say what I think necessarily. But you know, the one side you're going to get an argument that says, look, um, although we recognize that you know the federal code is got thousands of statutes in there. We can get you if we want to get you. Um, and then not only that, remember, there's another sovereign in play here. You know, it's the state. And a lot of times, state murder charges work pretty good in a domestic terrorism case. So the notion that a DT actor is somehow going to get away with something um, in the absence of a statute that criminalizes domestic terrorism at the federal level is probably not accurate. That said, um, it, some have argued that it would be useful to have such a statute with a view towards fixing in the public consciousness that type of activity as a species of evil higher in the hierarchy of evil than in, in no, 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 no violent criminal activity is good. Um, but, you know, again, fixing that in the public consciousness is somehow separate and distinct from your garden variety criminal activity. But then there are those on the other side of the equation that say, no, no, no. The last thing we need to do is hand federal authorities yet another tool that they will invariably use to target disenfranchised communities in the same manner that they did in the lead up to the church committee investigation back in the 70s. So you're going to get arguments on both sides of the equation. I will remain, uh, I'm, I'm not going to, uh, that, that, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Maybe one last quick one. Let's try another scholar here. I can, I can take a stab. Um, well, you know, and again, it's, this, is, this is another feature of the, the uh, legal architecture that undergirds domestic terrorism here in the United States that surprises a lot of people. You rightly note that we have a, we have a statutory mechanism to um, prescribe um, foreign terrorist organizations. You know, pull it up on the State Department website, you'll see the list. And if anybody gives anything like what's called material support to that organization, that is a federal criminal offense. $10 gift card, you know, Walmart gift card, you send it to Al-Shabaab, you're looking at 20 years. You're not going to get 20 years, but even so, um, <laughs> technically speaking. That said, there is no analog to that on the domestic terrorism side of the house. That is to say, there is presently no statutory mechanism to ban a purely domestic terrorist or domestic organization. And there's reasons for that. Um, I'd invite you to look at Holder v. Humanitarian Law Project. That, that kind of is a good rundown on, on where the court was thinking, at least at that time, with regard to the domestic analog to, to FTO con construction. Um, but the short answer is, you know, to the extent that, and I'll defer to my, uh, my colleague here um, with regard to charging decisions, but my sense of it is, you know, to the extent that you can you know, trace some sort of indusia of criminality or conspiracy um, in connection with some one of these entities and the underlying criminal activity that, is actually, that actually occurs or is perpetrated by individuals like the Oath Keepers or what have you, that is your inroad. But absent that indusia of criminality, it's going to be... You're running hard up into that 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 age-old struggle of liberty and security um, in terms of what 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 appetite do we have to, to criminalize that sort of activity absent any nex nexus or indicia of criminality or conspiracy. Right on uh, the nose there. I, I would say it, it's not illegal to be a proud boy. It's not illegal to support the proud boys or to go meet with the proud boys or to go march with the proud boys, uh, but. 
when any ideology is motivated towards violence, we have very powerful tools in our conspiracy statutes. And so if a business or an individual, whether they're a member of a group or not a member of that group, conspires with an individual or a group to do violence or to violate any federal law, whether that is, uh, in, in the case, I, case example I gave, manufacturing ghost guns and sending them uh, across state lines for money or, or whatever else, those that are co-conspirators in that plot, uh, they're subject to liability uh, and will be prosecuted. The same could be said, not just for the conspiracy statute, but the RICO statute. And I think that our prosecutors and agencies will continue to be getting smart on how to use our RICO statute in, uh, in domestic terrorism cases. Um, that's, that's another incredibly powerful tool in the absence of, a, you know, a material support uh, type of uh, tool. But we've got, we've got a, a buffet of options that we can, we, we feel confident that uh, we're using fairly effectively. But that shouldn't take away from having a dialogue about uh, a, a potential domestic terrorism statute. And I, I, I enjoy seeing that that dialogue among those varying interests is being had right now. I think it's a good dialogue. And, uh, and I think as a, as a nation, we will arrive at the right solution for this. I have every confidence that we will. Well, thank you very much. The mention of buffet kind of reminds me that we're at <laughs> lunch break. Uh, but let's thank this really tremendous panel.